Good morning. This is Susan Walker. I am co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar on Vibrant Cities, Advancing Green, Resilient, and Inclusive Urban Development. This webinar, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of is Gilles Durantin. Gilles Durantin is the Dean's Chair in Real Estate Professor in the Real Estate Department of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Gilles Durantin is a world-renowned expert in economic development and in the issues of inclusive, resilient urban development. And it is my pleasure now to turn the webinar over to Gilles Durantin. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce you to our two, to our two speakers and authors of this recent World Bank report called Vibrant Cities on the Bedrock of Stability, Prosperity, and Sustainability. So our two speakers are Forage Lippi and Shomik Lal. The full report is available in a link in the chat. Forhad is a senior economist in the development research group at the World Bank. Her research has to do with social mobility in developing countries, the microeconomics of climate resilience, and urban and regional economics. She's a, co she's a member of the World Development Report 2024 core team. Shomik Lal, another of the authors, is director of the World Bank's 2024 World Development Report, so he's been really busy lately, and he, which examines the challenges of economic growth in middle-income countries. He's also an economic advisor in the office of the World Bank Group Chief Economist, and previously he headed climate economics and was a climate economics and policy team in the World Bank Equitable Growth Finance and Institution Vice Presidency. So, Fohad and Shomik, the floor is yours. You have about twenty minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jill, and and good morning, colleagues, and uh, good afternoon to those watching online. Uh, Farhad and I will spend the next 20 minutes telling you a little bit about our new report called Vibrant Cities. Uh, um, so making our cities in developing countries vibrant and dynamic is a critical challenge today. And it's challenging because the economic growth prospects of emerging markets and developing economies are really weakening. And these economies in emerging markets are growing into even tighter spaces in terms of global trade fragmentation, trade restrictions, in terms of domestic policy limitations due to populist pressures, and in terms of climate change and climate action. And if you look at government debt, it's also at an all time high, with many middle income countries more indebted than ever before. The growth problem is really getting harder. And the question that we try to address in this report is how can cities in emerging markets and developing economies bring about economic dynamism to boost economic development? Next slide, please. And this report, the World Bank's report on vibrant cities sets out to answer this very question. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about what do we mean by the term a vibrant city. And the way we define it in the report is that it comes down to offering firms and families, and friends, remember, we'll keep using these words, firms and families, it offers firms and families high expectations of getting economic returns on their investments, whether it's in physical, human, or other forms of capital. And these are the expectations for a sustainable future, a resilient future, and for growth to be inclusive. But to do this, these cities first and foremost need to be productive. They need to be driving growth. They need to be creating jobs boosting incomes, and financing critical public goods. And when, when you look at the landscape in middle-income and, and low-income countries, cities, as Farhad will tell you, are not fulfilling that role. 
Second, the need to be inclusive. And here it is to enable every resident in a city to realistically aspire to a better life by investing in skills and through equitable access to jobs and other amenities. And again here, developing country cities are failing. And finally, it is for cities to provide an environment where people, both firms and families, are resilient and are developing in low carbon ways. It's reducing vulnerability to climate related hazards. It's rebounding for disasters and pandemics and limiting greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an incredibly complicated challenge and we try to simplify it using a simple framework in this report. Next slide, please. So how do city leaders think about getting productivity up, inclusion up, and making the cities resilient and low carbon. And what we identify are these three pillars in the report about inform, about support, and protect. And we say this because typically when policymakers and city leaders think about action, they think about targeted interventions that focus on protecting the vulnerable, and they do it in a way that's not temporary and that's not well targeted. But what we're saying, we need to change this conversation. The first thing is for city leaders to start realizing that firms and families are not passive in the urban development story. In fact, they are the main protagonists of urban growth. So how do we make sure that we set the expectations and motivate firms and families to act on market signals and on credible knowledge of government policies and plans. For example, if you were to look at emissions of uh, carbon emissions, globally, globally comparable and publicly available metrics on CO2 emissions will incentivize people and businesses as well as city and country governments to take on much more of a calibrated approach to low carbon development. Similarly, on work, for example, like Guy Michaels has done, if you have information on zoning and other regulations, they're basically providing signals to investors how to use scarce urban land and how investors can respond to market forces. So getting the information content right is very critical. The second is we need to be supporting firms and families with investments in the infrastructure and services that are based on rigorous assessments of econ uh, uh, and are economically defensible. And, and, and here, the idea is that these investments increase efficiency economically, socially, and ecologically. And finally, to protect vulnerable firms and families ways to buffer shocks in a timely manner, in a targeted manner, and in a temporary manner. But too often, they are, the actions that are taken are too late, untargeted, and are not removed when the, when the time goes by. Next slide, please. But, but the point here is that many of the points of inform, support, and protect are not new. And the question that comes up is, why do these rather obvious reform efforts fail? And there's a traditional view that's used in a lot of the policy work, that there are these vested interests in society who would really lose out from reforms, and they would organize themselves to oppose them. What we do in the report, friends, is take a modern view to it, a sort of view that folks like Tim Besley and others are developing. It is how do we improve trust and legitimacy in the urban governance system? And how do public servants and citizens' expectations of each other's behavior sort of guide actions? And in fact, what we have found through research in the Middle East and North Africa 
is to build legitimacy and trust, city governments must make official, make public officials accountable and accessible to firms and families, such as public discussions and local elections. And contestability becomes really important to show citizens and investors that markets are governed by common rules for all, not by privilege and influence, and communicate this to create common knowledge. Now let me turn to Forhad, who's going to tell you about the stylized facts we have uncovered as we worked on this report. Thank you very much, uh, Shomik. Uh, let me try to move this. So uh, we, as Shomik had shown you, we had three major buckets in the report and we would uh, focus on each of those and basically tell you the major challenges there very briefly. So the very first one we start with is this uh, sterile agglomeration. Uh, anybody who works on urban economics knows that you know cities are the you know uh, major center of growth uh, and innovation, and the innovation and growth is actually facilitated by the agglomeration externalities. Uh, unfortunately, uh, developing countries cities can be characterized more as you know crowded places than you know. Uh, center of economic density. And this is why we uh, term urbanization without productivity gain as sterilized, sterile <laughs> agglomeration. Okay, so here are some evidence on this. Uh, here we are looking at the agglomeration in elasticities. If you look at the uh, uh, nominal uh, wages or nominal uh, labor productivity, what you see is that these externalities are actually positive in developing country cities as well. But once you start controlling for some, uh, uh, you know, characteristics of the cities, those disappear very quickly. And the most important of that characteristics is the urbanization cost, urban cost. And urban cost, unfortunately, is quite, you know, steep in developing countries, cities, as you can see the, from these pictures, uh, whether you look at pollution, disamenities, congestion, or crime. Actually, in, you know, as Jill's work has shown, traffic speeds in uh, developing countries, cities can be described more as, you know, crawling than moving, okay? Um, and not only that, uh, there is also the economic structure of the cities are not uh, very conducive for positive productivity growth. A lot of the city activities are actually non-tradable and these are actually quite low productive non-tradable activities that you see, okay? So these are uh, some of the factors that we discussed in the report in a lot more details. Uh, let me move on to the second challenges for the cities and which is social inclusion. I want to spend a little bit time on this picture. This is a picture of a slum which lies in the shadow of uh, uh, you know, the most expensive house in a home, actually, not house, in the world, and that, that is the money house, which is valued more than a billion dollars. And as you can see in this pic picture, if the parent of this little child, this little girl, uh, think that she's going to be stuck in this slum, there is very little incentive for them to invest on her human capital and so on. And this is precisely the point that we want to emphasize in this paper, in this report. And in terms of, you know, uh, so to tell you that, you know, uh, if a city is socially fractious, it does not really inspire its citizens to invest on both human and uh, physical capital. And the reason being is that if people think that there is no way of moving up 
unless you are born with some privileges, then people also don't have the incentive to do so. And unfortunately, the cities in uh, developing countries are not lands of, uh, you know, opportunities for its residents. And to give you some evidence on this, uh, look at these inequality measures across cities, large cities in, you know, different countries. What you can see here is that inequality is quite large in many cities. But I want to emphasize here is that inequality per se is not the problem. Cities are the places where skilled workers uh, congregate. And, you know, the, their efforts, their ingenuity has to be rewarded. And as a result of which cities tend to be more unequal. But there are many examples of cities which are actually provide, doing a very good job of providing opportunities for up, upward mobility. An example is uh, San Francisco, which is uh, income inequality is quite high. And it, this is also a place which offers a lot of upward mobility. Unfortunately, that's not the case in the developing countries. Cities, to tell you the story, let me explain a little bit of the concept on what we mean by you know opportunities and how we measure it. We actually measure it in terms of what we call intergenerational mobility on the left hand. So there are two different concepts. On the left hand side, we have parents on, a, on an escalator. And on the right hand side, we have the children on an escalator. And upward mobility is something, you know, a, Sometimes the politicians ask you, are you doing better than you had been doing four years ago? Here the question is, are children doing better than the parents? And if they are, that is what we call absolute mobility, upward mobility. And in the bottom half of the picture, what you can see is what we call the relative mobile intergenerational mobility. And that is actually used as a measure of uh, econ uh, inequality in opportunities. The idea here is that are children doing better than a parent in terms of their position on the social or economic ladder? Okay, so that's basically the concept. And when you look at the, this mobility in developed versus uh, developing countries, and this is all done in terms of education because that's what the data availability is, what you can see is that in terms of absolute mobility, developing countries are doing well. They are moving up. It's the high income countries which are not doing well. And that is the reason for a lot of social discontent in the high income countries. If you look at the relative mobility, actually developing countries are not doing well at all. It means that yes, uh, kids are moving up, but you know, whether they are able to move up depends very much from what kind of families they are coming from. Poor children from poor families are not moving up. I want to, you know, uh, give you a little bit of good news here too, which is that urban areas are actually doing better than the rural areas if you do the within country comparison in developing countries. And in fact, those of the students who are in the audience would be also curious about knowing what would happen to the girl in the slum. Uh, the evidence is that in terms of education, the, she will move up. But in, when it comes to job, no, she won't be able to escape the slum itself. And that is where cities are not doing a very good job in developing countries. Uh, if we compare uh, cities in developing countries to developed countries, the you know the inequality of opportunity is quite staggering. And I'm going to end with that note and move uh, over to uh, Shomik. Great, right, thanks for that. I'm going to quickly go with the other pillar of this report, which is to look at uh, resilience and and what we systematically find. Uh, can we go to the next slide, is that while the exposure to natural hazards does not, you know, often is about the same across income groups in cities, 
a lot of research that we have found shows that vulnerability to natural hazards is much greater for the poorest. And the chart that you see on the right here is to look at Accra, where flooding and the uh, while, while flooding is hurting everyone uh, or, or everyone in the city is about equally exposed to flooding, the damage in terms of assets is much greater for, for the poorest. Next slide. So this comes to a question that we can go to the next slide. I just want to use the framework is to see how do we think about enhancing resilience in developing countries? And too often, and I would like our discussant to tell us if this makes sense, too often we realize that, or we rely, or governments believe that people are helpless victims and they need to be told what to do and public interventions are the only way to kind of reduce risk and vulnerability to natural hazards. What we in this report do is try to reframe the conversation and the debate by using the modified, this is a, a framework de developed by Ehrlich and Becker, where we ask the questions on what is the role of self-protection, investment, and then markets in, in terms of mitigating or managing risk from natural hazards. And what we do very systematically is to ask whether public interventions, do they strengthen or discourage private actors? Do, does improve risk pricing through market insurance enhance self-protection? or do policy buyers invest less to protect themselves, and whether public investment crowds in or crowds out private insurance. Next slide, please. We also, in the report, provide first-hand information on an area that is significantly under-researched and where the knowledge base is very limited in cities, that is carbon emissions. So typically when we look at carbon emissions, the only data that we have comes from model data. And these are models that are used based on a few uh, sectors in a few developed country cities. Now those models, engineering models, are used to back out and estimate emissions for a whole range of other places. So we really don't believe those parameters are useful. So what we have done in the report is to look at satellite-based direct measurement of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And using our methodology, one can differentiate how much emissions can be attributed to a city in a given moment in time relative to the broader absorption of CO2 that's concentrated in the atmosphere. And this comes from research we have done using satellite data from NASA's OCO2 satellite. And using this data, we have been able to identify the hotspots of CO2 emissions in the world. And the next slide, we, we also provide a very interesting examination between urban density and CO2 emissions. Often urban planners are very quick to tell us the densification is really good to save on carbon emissions and other sort of uh, amenities. But what we find that these benefits in terms of CO2 savings only come when countries or cities are more than about $2,000 per capita. And the reason is, as Forhad explained earlier, if you're a city that's just crowded with people, and not dense in economic activity, all we are seeing is more people concentrated in a city using dated technologies of burning fuel and other kind of uh, 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 fossil fuels. And those cities don't really have the resources to either build tall structures or invest in public transportation. The benefits really come in cities that are, 
have had output and productivity growth. So I think this is something that, that that's important that often we are very quick to say densification is the only is a really important strategy for CO2 uh, CO2 reduction. But what we systematically find is that it's income growth that matters, not people per square kilometer per se. Next slide, please. I just want to kind of end. Uh, let's go to the next slide since we're running out of time. Is is that a lot of the facts that we have demonstrated in the report, you may say, well, what's new? We sort of know that, or we sort of understand that productivity. Sorry, Gilles, I will wrap up. Let's just uh, give me one more minute. So, so typically what you, you would say, listen, we know that productivity in middle in, in developing countries is, is lower. Inclusion issues are challenging, and most cities are vulnerable to natural hazards. So what do we do about it? And the next slide, what we do is, is provide, is to try to see how urban governance really matters. And rather than thinking about simple ideas that it has to do with vested interests who block progress, we in fact look very carefully at legitimacy, which is the ability of leaders to win compliance with new laws, or public orders because there's a widespread belief in the public that others also comply. And trust consists of a belief that behaving cooperatively in society is important, that motivates others to do so. And here the city of Casablanca provides a really good example where this relationship between the city and service providers is governed by laws that are aimed to promote transparency in awarding of management contracts to promote good contractual relations between the delegator and the delegatee, and a cadre of well-established and actually capable public servants. So in fact, I would encourage everyone to read the report because we make a strong link between the diagnostics of what's challenging a developing country city and how urban governance can help address these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for Hal and, Sh and Shomik. We will now have our discussions, Guy Michael and, Sh and, uh, and Omar Masood will to respond. And I will thank also for Hal for the more crawlings and moving. I will keep that for, for our research for sure. That's a, great, uh, that's a great summary. So we'll start with Guy Michaels, who's an associate professor of economics at the London School of Economics. He's also the director of the labor market program at the Center for Economic Performance at the LSE. And he serves as an associate editor at the Economic Journal. His research, which uh, many of us are, are huge fans of, or is focusing on urban economics, labor economics, and economic development. Before giving the floor to Guy, let me also briefly introduce Omar Masood. Omar served as the CEO of the Urban Unit since June 2020. He's also the member of the Cities That Work Well Council at, at the International Growth Center at the LSE. At the Urban Unit, he's managing a team of 150 professionals working on different aspects of urbanization and advising different levels of the government in Pakistan. Currently, he's focusing on how urban data can be made an effective urban policy and action instrument at the city, local, and regional level. So let's start with Guy for 10 minutes and then Omar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gilles, and thank you, um, um, Bohad and Shomik, for a really uh, very, very interesting and uh, kind of uh, uh, absorbing report. So the scope is, is, is really amazing. The focus um, here is the Middle East and North African cities, but a lot of the uh, discussion is, is really much broader. And I think this came through in the, in the presentation. Um, there's a nice combination of a lot of evidence, including kind of new uh, research evidence, uh, some by the authors themselves and some from you know, others. And, and concrete policy advice. So, you know, very, very uh, welcome uh, report. Um, in, in these kind of brief slides, I'll follow the chapters in, in the report. So I'll summarize in black and I'll kind of comment in, in blue. And the comments are mostly kind of be, well, you know, I want to see more. <laughs> um, so first chapter is about um, cities and making cities resilient. And a lot of it 
the, the discussion is dedicated, dedicated to flooding. Flooding is kind of is one of the biggest uh, risks that cities face. It's a recurrent, uh, massive shock. Uh, cities tend to locate in places, you know, near coasts and rivers where um, a lot of flooding uh, occurs. Um, so this is kind of a repeated problem. And then there's kind of the, the problem that this gets worse uh, with sea level rise. And um, as, as, as Sean Mc mentioned, you know, poor cities uh, tend to suffer more and within cities, uh, poor residents tend to suffer more. Um, in terms of the response, this also came, came through in the presentation. Um, the report doesn't take people as kind of passive. It thinks about individual solutions, individuals you know, trying to protect themselves, ensure themselves to some extent, get some public uh, support for that. I think in some of the work that you know that Chomek has done and, and some of the work that, that we did uh, as well, it's it's you know it's not clear how much adaptation though you get at the end of the day to all of this. So a lot of you know uh, a lot of these kind of problems recur. Uh, the report also talks about COVID, the very different types of type of shock. But you know one common element is again you know it's the poor countries that suffer more in terms of growth and the poorest residents who, who suffer the most. And, and the report really offers this kind of, you know, set of sensible policy um, um, lessons. Um, so one thing is really to, to inform the public in order to facilitate market-based uh, responses where these are possible, like insurance, then support the residents through uh, public investments in public goods and, and zoning. And, and uh, for those for whom the market uh, really doesn't do a good job for the very poor, uh, provide some targeted uh, support. So this is all uh, very welcome um, in terms of suggestions. What would I have to add? I think you talk a lot about um, about flood related problems, but I think you know one of the things that would be uh, useful to say is that some market based solutions like buying air conditioning, moving to another city, moving into uh, cheap land that's just being flooded might create other policy challenges. So you know the market can help solve, but the market can also create more difficulties. And what I would like to know more in particular is about flood insurance and reinsurance in Middle East and North Africa, the sense is that this is a difficult market to manage even in developed countries. So, you know, we want to know more about how this works or, or what the issues are in, in, in this context. Um, and I would also like to see more about other types of climate related shocks. You talk a little bit, but I would like to see more about kind of lethal urban heat waves and, and droughts that might slow down um, urban growth. So I think these are all good things to, to incorporate in the framework. Um, and, you know, just to kind of expand a little bit on this, you know, we, you know, this was in a, in a recent uh, World Bank conference, they just took a snapshot. Uh, this is the mayor of Freetown talking about how um, poor uh, neighborhoods in her city in Freetown, Sierra Leone, um, are expanding in, into the sea. And, you know, work that, that we did with some, some co-authors also shows um, more of that happening, even in the US, where people are building on, on flood prone land. So this seems to be a common problem that is making uh, flooding uh, worse. And I think it's good to, to, you know, to kind of take note of that and try to do more to, to address this. Um, the second point kind of, you know, flows really directly from this. It's kind of the idea that, you know, climate change is an issue and, you know, we need to decarbonize. And, um, you know, Shomik um, and, and um, Fohad really showed how you know this uh, problem? How density can be an aid in in rich countries, but not necessarily in, in poor countries. And really, this is a problem that we need to collectively uh, pitch in and and do something about. Um, again, the policy suggestions are are kind of you know um, along this kind of coherent uh, three line. Um, approach to so try to inform, set expectations, motivate adaptation, not to do all the heavy lifting by, by the government because that's that's difficult with limited state capacity. Support, you know, rather than do carbon pricing, try to kind of promote urban planning and mass transit to kind of help alleviate the problem and compensate and upskill uh, the poor. Um, so what I think would be useful to see more on is about the role of green transition for oil exporters with large public sectors. I think there's more of that you know, elsewhere in the paper, in the in the report, but I think it would be kind of you know uh, important to acknowledge some of the hard trade-offs that are involved here. In terms of uh, global policies like the EU uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, these are kind of things that would effectively increase uh, the price of carbon, even if countries don't impose it themselves, and it will hit especially kind of energy-intensive exporters in, in poor cities. And uh, I would also like to see more about kind of the role of solar energy. It seems this has become much more effective 
and something that could very work, work very well in uh, Middle East and North Africa. So I think would be useful uh, to know more about in this context. Um, the next step, which is really important, is about making cities more inclusive. And there's a lot of discussion in, in the report, a lot of useful stuff about, um, you know, how large cities tend to make uh, you know, contribute to inequality. Some of this is sorting and some of this is effects and Gilles knows a lot about this. And, um, you know, inequalities tend to persist and they, you know, they, they persist across generations and this is kind of an inherent problem and, and also kind of a recipe for social unrest. Uh, but cities also offer some, you know, uh, opportunities at least for ab absolute intergenerational ascent. And I think that's, that's important. And so the question is how do we make cities more inclusive? And the policy recommendations here are kind of, you know, uh, are very sensible, you know, improve and broaden access to housing and jobs and finance and school and transportation, while providing kind of targeted uh, safety nets, uh, incentives, information and, and property rights. Um, you know, I think in this context in particular, uh, women's work is an important uh, part of making uh, cities more inclusive. And I think, you know, there's some in the report, but again, I think this is, this is a point that can't be uh, you know, um, kind of, uh, we can't say enough about. And also kind of to say one more thing from work that we've been, uh, that I've been involved in, you know, about kind of land markets and, you know, trying to uh, help land markets function better. So uh, the idea of the Novo planning, so planning on greenfields area, this is something that can improve property rights and access, which is very important, crowd in uh, investment and can be cost effective and, and, and affordable for the poor. You can see here what happens kind of, you know, if you don't do planning and if you do do planning and, and this matters, a lot and, and, and you know planning is, is useful but needs to be done uh, carefully. Um, the fourth chapter briefly is about making six cities more productive. As Shomik said, this is crucial to you know give the, the income base to do all the good things uh, uh, that we should be doing. Uh, cities should be engines of, of growth and you know the question is how to you know uh, allow them to compete more in markets for tradables. In the Middle East and North Africa, uh, and along with other uh, developing country cities, there are kind of fewer benefits from agglomeration in other places because a lot of the industry composition tends to be concentrated in uh, either public sector or low growth sector and labor force participation of empl and employment rates are, are low, especially for women. So some of the challenges here are to kind of make sure that the skills are relevant, not just that people go to university, but they get relevant skills and they get matched to, uh, to jobs. Uh, to make sure that there is kind of useful transportation allows the spatial differentiation between what is happening in the central business district and what is happening in the suburbs. And, you know, um, the point of, you know, urban costs, which Gilles has done a lot on, uh, also came across, so I won't belabor this. Uh, but, you know, the report does include kind of, you know, some discussion of recent um, uh, modeling developments by Steve Redding and others on how to kind of, you know, make this uh, work. Um, in general, uh, my kind of, you know, on, on, on my wish list is kind of to see more about economic uh, diversification, competitiveness, and kind of firm level evidence uh, in, in oil rich economies where this kind of, you know, some aspects of Dutch disease could be kind of important. And the last uh, chapter is about governance reform, you know, uh, talking about the role of uh, improved fiscal capacity and credit worthiness of cities, decentralization, the role of legitimacy and, and trust in city governments. And again, Casablanca was kind of given as an example and, 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 and you know, the extent to which you can protect the poor. I think here, what would be really useful is more evidence on, on what, uh, what works. How do you actually facilitate this? You know, these are great goals. The question, how do we exactly get there? Thanks. Thank you so much, Guy. Now we're going to turn to, we're going to turn to Omar Masudo. Uh, yes, thank you, Gil, uh, and thank you, Guy, uh, for uh, this introduction. And this is a good seg segue. I have only one slide uh, that I will be presenting. Uh, these are more in shape of my talking points, but I think uh, the way this thing has panned out, it has come right at the opportune moment. I would not be speaking more from the economics point of view of the report, but I would be speaking more from the uh, policy and the implementation uh, uh, you know, uh, part of such documents. Uh, we in the civil service always receive these documents. The urban unit reads up on these documents. 
and we try to somehow get some space for them when it comes to policy making and actual implementation. Uh, you know, my first observation is really uh, we we have been talking about resilience, inclusivity, and productivity, and I'm very happy it's one of the first uh, or, the, or the very few reports which have actually broken down these things into chapters. Usually, resilience and productivity and inclusivity is conflated in previous World Bank documentation. That makes you know, policy making out of it pretty hard. So it's good that we have got finally chapters and this thing is being broken down. But at the end of the day, I think we will be seeking some indicators of what is good resilience and what is bad resilience, for example. What is a good inclusive policy and what is a bad one? And, uh, you know, productivity is the latest entrant. So when it comes to policy making, we have now more and more variables and we need to have indicators for these variables. My second point is, and I've been talking about it a lot in the last several years, is this gap between economics and urban planning. It has always been there, so it's not something new. But I've been looking at it for the last three, four years, and the question that I put to the audience is, is this gap closing or converging, or are we still at the same point? Uh, so today when I saw that uh, that graph of uh, densification is only good if you are above a certain threshold of income. I thought that the gap has sort of widened a bit. But, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you know, this is very important because as you go down to the ground level, uh, the economics sort of is left uh, behind and urban planning takes over. And there has to be a convergence between these two fields. I still feel there is uh, st still some room left. My third point, and I, um, this is what the urban unit is trying to work on these days, is really this growing significance and availability of disaggregated data at city level. I'm really surprised I'm speaking from Lahore. This is a city of more than 12 million people. And I was looking at some of the maps uh, in the report. We just got our first neighborhood, uh, neighborhood census level data from census of 2017, like six months ago. This has happened for the first time. So you can you can very well imagine uh, that while we can talk about resilience and productivity and inclusivity, data has to keep pace uh, and has to be disaggregated and made available at the city level. Uh, another more uh, interesting point is that while we want to make cities vibrant, we also have to uh, introspect a bit and look at the existing rules and organizations and, and ask ourselves this question that are they equipped for resilience and productivity policy and implementation? My answer to that is that they are not. Uh, one reason is that we being bureaucracies and municipal government also being urban bureaucracies uh, uh, tend to go by rules. So how do I frame rules or checklists for good urban resilience? Or what do I have to say about inclusivity? I have a lot to say about land use and permissible use and non-permissible use because these rules have been sort of enshrined for the last 30, 40 years in every local government documentation that you see about urban governance. But then we do not have rules for resilience and inclusivity and I can talk about it at any policy making forum and people do listen to me. But at the end of the day, they ask me the question that how would we implement them? Are there certain rules that we can actually develop so that we can have a more resilient Lahore, for example, or a more productive uh, city of Lahore? And over here, I think we have a lot of hard work to do. Uh, I, 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 I personally believe that you know, this is one area uh, that uh, we can uh, really, uh, you know, get a lot of help from academia, from institutions like the World Bank. And uh, following from that, uh, uh, you know, there were examples in the report of good positive outcomes, like uh, increasing uh, connectivity to uh, B, uh, through BRT or through subway links or train links within the city, in, uh, you know, in, in some cases. But my question precedes that that how do we get to that positive outcome? There has to be a process that these cities follow to get to that positive outcome. Uh, here in Lahore, we have uh, two, we have got a metro line and we have got a train line, but we have not seen any positive outcomes emerging out of it. 
Uh, there has not been any transit oriented development along them. Uh, the lines are pretty much uh, running on government subsidy. One of them is uh, making losses while it passes from a very dense area of the city. So uh, my suggestion would be that perhaps in the future, we have to look at more use of case studies, perhaps, of you know, cities which have been successful for policymakers and for uh, civil servants like myself, case studies are perhaps a better sell in trying to emulate or replicate something uh, than perhaps a regression. Not that uh, regression holds no value. Regression simply uh, you know, verifies and ratifies that what the idea that you were thinking, actually it proves the point. But when it comes to implementation, I think case studies uh, have a lot to contribute uh, in the urban arena. And uh, second last, again, this is uh, emerging from the uh, discussion from previous participants. We need to have more knowledge about firms and employment in the city. Uh, so far, uh, if you look at South Asia and uh, cities in South Asia, I can tell you that all municipal planning, all city level planning is done from the point of view of residents of the city. It is not being done from the point of view of firms and employees who work in the city. And you know that is something uh, we have very little data on, uh, very, very little data on. So when we talk about, say, pro productivity, can we say that what is the contribution of this city to the GDP of that country or that province? Or what is that city contributing in terms of its GDP? What are its resources? And, um, you know, what is the firm level productivity, say, of Islamabad and the city of Lahore as compared to the city of Karachi, which is on, which is on, the, on the coast? So, you know, what type of investments do you need to make to increase that productivity level? So unless you have data about firms and employees within the city, it's, it's really hard, you know, even infrastructure development becomes very hard. Any connectivity investment that you want to make, you have to be sure of what is the uh, firm and employment data in that particular city. And finally, um, I will not take much of the time, uh, but I would like to uh, stress upon uh, this uh, idea that urban infrastructure carries a lot of momentum for change. So I was thinking before uh, making this presentation to give you a totally different type of a slide, but then I changed my mind. Uh, you know, if some of us have done physics, momentum is basically the mass of something into the velocity. So right now, if I look at resilience, inclusivity, and productivity, they might have a lot of velocity attached to them because a lot of work is being done, uh, you know, done on them but they do not have a very large mass. So their momentum is not that great because the mass is something which is more historical, which is being so entrenched in municipal and urban uh, planning that you know it has to be there. So when we talk about urban infrastructure, whether we are talking about connectivity, whether we are talking about water and sanitation, schools and hospitals, uh, we have to keep in mind that that has, while it not, carry a lot of velocity, but it has a lot of mass attached to it. And it has a lot of momentum. And whenever you are thinking of urban infrastructure, you are talking about an opportunity which can give you a momentum for change and spaces for change. So when we talk about having greater city resilience, I think that can only be emerged if the city is working on a great infrastructure project in which you can you know, rope in so much of data and uh, do so much of ancillary work. So the spillover benefit of an infrastructure project in the policy domain uh, largely go unnoticed, you know. Uh, so if you are talking about a BRT or a mass transit, uh, uh, transit system in a city, you would eventually be talking about productivity. You would be eventually be talking about where are the firms located and everything else. So my final sort of a parting comment is, Please use uh, the opportunities of urban infrastructures as an opportunity for change. And that is how uh, we feel that in the policy world, this thing can happen. Uh, thank you very much. And now over to Gilis for uh, the remaining session. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ramar, for those comments. And thank you also, guys, for, for your comments as well. So 
before we move to the Q&A, uh, I would ask people to the audience, please put your question in the in the relevant box. In the meantime, let's give Shomik and Forad a few minutes well, to respond to the comments. Right, thanks so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, Forad, do you wanna go first? Because I have uh, several thoughts. Uh, yeah, I can go first, okay. Thank you very much, uh, both Guy and Omar. The comments are very, very relevant. Uh, there is very little that we can disagree. You know, you kind of gave us a big homework here. Uh, with that, I want to just, you know, touch up on only a couple of things, and uh, I'm sure uh, Shomik has a lot more. Uh, there was some comments on the climate resilience from um, Guy. Uh, the reason the this report focused a lot more on flooding was that we had a companion report which looked at all kinds of uh, climate shocks. So maybe we need to cross-reference a little bit more on that. Uh, on the question of flood insurance and so on, it's a very relevant question. And this is a, this gives me a opportunity to advertise more work, which is that we are doing some work on climate resilience right now and particularly focusing on different types of insurance and why they are, you know, working in some countries, not working in some some other countries to tell you just in one line response to that, that the thing, the this insurance do not work as well in developed countries is because there is too many interventions on them. Okay, so I, I wouldn't say that that is the model to follow. On the women's work, very relevant point, and it's a really, really important point. And actually we are working on this in other, context right now, so well taken. Uh, on uh, on uh, Omar's co comment, I cannot, you know, agree more on the need for data. And as I was hearing you, I was also thinking about Cape Town, uh, a city with which we have a lot of research uh, linkage, and that's a city which collects all this data everything at the fingertip and so on. And I was thinking maybe we need to connect you guys with the Cape Town to show how this works. That's one of the things. The other thing is that as a follow-up for this work, we also had some modeling work done for Amman and Casablanca. So these are things that can be replicated, I am sure for Lahore, depending on what problem that Lahore wants to you know, address. With that, over to you, Shomik. Thank you. Uh, Guy and Omar, I think those were very helpful and provocative comments. So I'm gonna address four issues I think that were raised. And I think on top of it, Omar, what our aim is to bridge the gap between urban planning and urban econ so that the information that we produce becomes more useful to policymakers such as yourself. But to do that, I think for cities, especially in middle-income countries like yours, Omar, we need to rethink the diagnostic approach. At this time, you know, there has been a swing from analytic and research that used to focus in rich countries to one that focused entirely on the poorest countries. And so when we looked at the poorest countries, we always thought, Small firms are good. Small firms create most jobs, but that's not the case. It's actually large firms that create a lot of the jobs. So for you as an urban policymaker, you would have to say, what are the constraints from productive firms from getting larger and from large firms to create more jobs? How do my infrastructure investments help them? And that takes a very different approach. And that's what, Omar, we have tried to do in this report through the modeling framework that we applied to Cairo. So I think we need to have a rethink of just how we thought about issues like small firms are good to rethinking the questions. The second thing on inclusion, I think there's no one who would disagree that poverty reduction 
and improvements of lives of the world of people in the bottom end of your distribution is a laudable goal. But the point we raise in this report, it's not only the lower end of the distribution, it is about social mobility. Now, I'm not sure if everyone agrees with that, right? Because that means the elite in society will find their positions challenged. And that's, again, something very different in terms of policy than something everyone agrees that improving lives of the poor is a laudable goal. So how do we think about that? The third on resilience, and I think, Guy, you made an important, thank you for acknowledging and, and highlighting it. Typically, policymakers and often researchers think about individuals as helpless victims. But in fact, people are active adapters. And how do we let active adaptation play out? And sometimes it may be information that matters and less so infrastructure, because often infrastructure may create a moral hazard for people to invest in places that would be prone to floods. Finally, in terms of CO2 emissions, too often our developing countries are told you need to move from one source of energy to another source of energy. But that is a very imperfect way of dealing with the problem. What we should worry is the carbon intensity of our urban and national economies and how a country goes about that, whether it looks at carbon taxes, it looks at public investments, it, it looks at other kinds of policies to curb energy, to improve energy efficiency should be left to the city or the country. But that requires a lot of analysis. And again, to aid on that, Omar, we have provided a whole range of tools. So we'd be very helpful, happy to come have a chat with you on how we can make some of these results much more useful to your decision making. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. We have a question in the chat about mobility and in, and um, in rich versus poor cities. For how do you want to opine on this? Sorry, I don't see the question. That's the problem. So I might have missed Michel. Ms. Lippi explained what factor is making high income countries absolute mobility decrease while the same country's relative mobility is increasing. Can you please explain? Okay, yes, I can explain that. So <laughs> uh, think of it. Uh, this is talking about education, right? If everybody has college education, there is no way of going up, right? So think when you have a population which has you know a lot of education, the upward mobility is kind of you know uh, limited at the at the top because you can't really go further than that. But what has happened in uh, developed developed countries is that on average, relative to the parents, children are not as educated. So this is like having just mean, okay? The average education has not gone up. That's, and this is true in many of the, you know, industrial cities and areas in US that relative to parents, children are not doing as well. Relative mobility is that, you know, are children coming from a poorer background, are they moving up? Are they doing better than their parents? And that has happened. So the overall average has gone down. Uh, that's because, you know, on the top, there is no more room to move. But on the bottom side, people did move up. And on, from the top, there is sliding down. Okay. So that's the technical <laughs> explanation of this. Uh, this is a very big deal in much of Europe and US that in, you know, industrial rust belts, you are seeing this, you know, uh, decline in absolute mobility that uh, people coming from middle, uh, middle class families are actually doing worse than their parents, okay? And this is the reason for a lot of the political discontent. Does that make 
make it clear? Yes, thank you very much. So to finish, one question for me. And like Guy, I was very impressed by Meyer Ivonoki's Sawyer from Freetown in Sierra Leone. And one of the key examples was to show us people living in a seaside neighborhood in Freetown who were who kept dumping well garbage well into the sea until there was enough garbage that they could actually build new housing on it. Of course, this is a terrible idea because the first tsunami or the first big wave will take those people away and kill most of them. Uh, these people have been informed and she's tried to offer some relocation solutions and stuff, but it looks like nobody has moved. So is informing enough and is informing, uh, supporting and even protecting enough? Or how can we protect people in those situations? Um, okay. Can I, uh, Shomi, can I go ahead and answer this? Yes, please, go <laughs> oh, ahead. Okay. So, so this is a, you know, very interesting problem, right? So what happens is that the very first question that you want to ask is that why are these people um, staying in those areas? These are vulnerable and so on. These people do know about it, right? The simple reason is that many of these countries, the urban housing market is totally messed up to the extent that housing cost is so high that poor people end up living in very vulnerable areas. So yes, informing is not good enough. You do need to fix your housing market so that there is affordable housing. That That's needed. And of course, these people might also need a bit of help. And the way we put it in the, in the report is that you do have to combine all three of this because there's a lot of complementarity across different policy solution under each of those buckets. Okay, over to you, Shomik. No, I don't have much to add there. Just uh, for, in a lot of places, maybe it's not just the, the incentives, but having strong zoning laws and sticking to them might actually have prevented some of these uh, kind of uh, landfills in the first place. Okay, thank you very, very much to all of you, to our two speakers and to our two, two discussants. Uh, Suzanne, this is back to you. Yes, thank you so much. This is an extremely important report. And Shomik and Farhad, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for presenting today and for the report itself. And Omar and Guy, thank you for your very, very in insightful comments. And most of all, thank you, Gilles Duranton, for bringing us all together and for the series, This is a Part. The World Bank is doing so much today, and it, we have a great need to bring together urban thinkers and economists and policy uh, uh, and practitioners, policymakers and practitioners. And this is one form to do so uh, with the um, thinking and visioning of the important issues uh, that we're so grateful to you, Gilles, for doing. Thank you to our audience. Thank you all.